Um, so I will talk a bit about the nonlinear, the MINLP in SCIP. Um, you also see my slides, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so this slide we have seen already in the talk of Leon today. So this is how SCIP is seeing an MINLP. Uh, SCIP needs a linear objective function, which you can always get by reformulating it. Um, and then you have some constraints gk of x, like in an in inequality form or equality, and they can be convex or non-convex, and we need to give them, have them given in algebraic form. I will say in the next slide what that means, and then you can have a integrality, and any other kind of constraints that you can have in skip. Bounds are quite important if you want to solve non-convex MINLPs, and the method that skip is using is then a spatial branch and bound. Um, so yeah, how does Skip handle this? Um, so the first thing one should know is there are like five constraint handlers, let's say four or five, that are specific to nonlinear uh, constraints in Skip. And the most general one is the nonlinear, and that stores the uh, um, problem functions, the expression, uh, yeah, the constraints in such an expression graph. So for this one here, it's like if you have a constraint like this one, um, then you have a graph here where um, you have something like, well, you see the flow of computation here, the log x times uh, y is here times two, and this is all summed up with the log x square and so on. Um, <coughs> and the operators that you can use and skip are basically variables and constants and things like basic operations like this and there are a number of power operators, rational exponents, integer exponents, and this is like a signed power. Um, exp exp and log is available. These are somehow there, but they probably don't work well at the moment. And then there are some more complex ones, which are basically the same as the one above, but they store more structure in one expression mode. Um, and then there are some additional constraint handlers for quadratic constraints, um, something very special for, for this kind of constraints because they came up in some gas network applications that were used, where skip was used. And then there's something for second order cones. Um, and what happens then in pre-solve is that um, then yeah, if you have a constraint like this one here, Skip is um, reformulating this into a, into a simpler or into a larger set of constraints that are of a more uh, simple structure. So um, everything that um, you see here, all the, these are like five constraints that this one constraint is reformulated into, there are new variables added. And for all of these, functions here on the right hand side, they are kind of convex or concave or, um, or quadratic. And this is the one that then the, in the solve um, the prop, uh, skip is working on. Um, yeah, okay, then you can compute bounds. And then when we come to the solving step, so this is branch and bound. And for the bounding, the LP relaxation is used in skip, um, which is obtained first uh, like in the MIP case for by relaxing integrality. Um, then we are um, convexifying uh, something has got uh, convexify non-convex um, constraints, which is like um, uh, yeah, if you have a concave function, then you then we are computing an underestimator by taking the left and the right bounds and computing the secant there. If you have something like an x cube, um, then we can compute the underestimator like this. And for the x times y, it looks a bit like this. Um, oh, this was a slide, sorry, that I meant to have here. So convex, uh, concave, um, odd power cubes and products. And then the next step is to linearize um, so if you have here still something round, then this will become um, underestimated by linear function. This one is already linear. This one might become two hyperplanes and so on. And this is also already 
for the uh, two underestimators here for the product. So this is how the AP relaxation is computed. And for concave functions, you see, also in this case here, you see that the underestimator that is computed here is somehow depending on the bounds of the variables. And uh, that's where then the branching come into play, um, which happens either on a fractional integer variable or if there's a constraint that was violated and which was non-convex, um, then we branch on a variable in this constraint so that in the after in the, in the nodes that are created, we can compute a tighter um, uh, linear relaxation. So this one is here what one for the x square. And length. if I have my under my overestimator would be something like this one here, the left bound. Um, it's L is here the lower bound, U is the upper bound. Um, so my relaxation would be something like the, the red area. And if I have then a point, if my LP relaxation solution is somewhere in here, we, we might branch on the variable X at this point, creating two child nodes, one um, where X is smaller than a quarter and one where it's larger than a quarter. And then in each of the child nodes, we can create a tighter relaxations. Um, and this point that was feasible for the LP before is not feasible anymore. Um, and then one other important technique is bound tightening that I want to mention. So um, as we have just seen, bounds are pretty important if you deal with non-convex um, terms. Um, so we can also try to um, compute tighter bounds um, during the solve. And one of the most important method um, is um, to utilize this expression graph here and to do some interval arithmetic um, to compute um, tighter bounds on um, variables given the constraint and the current bounds. So for example, if we have x, y being in one to four and one to four, then we can use interval arithmetic to compute some bounds on each of the terms in between here. Um, so we get a two to uh, something like larger than four, I think, but then we intersect this one here, the interval for the sum with the interval that is given by the constraint. And then we basically do the interval arithmetic um, backwards. So we can compute now new bounds for the operators um, given the parent operator and the other operators here. So I think for an easy one is like something like we have here in y square and we somehow got from the constraint that y square to be between one and three. So y has to be between one and square root of three. And so we have found a tighter bound for y than one four is now one and square root of three. Um, and then there are a number of more techniques in SCIP to handle MINLP. So there are primal heuristics um, that try to find feasible solutions early. There are a number that um, just solve NLPs. Then um, there's some that solve sub MINLP. So you take the whole problems, you restrict it to a smaller feasible area and hope that the smaller MINLP can be solved faster with uh, these large neighborhood search heuristics. And there's one heuristic that tries to find the submit um, from the MINLP by fixing continuous variables in nonlinear terms. Yeah, not, not exactly continuous, to so fix variables in nonlinear terms. So like a, a x and an x times y. Um, and then solve the remaining bit. And then there are a number of further methods to try to tighten the relaxation. So there's a recognition whether a quadratic constraint is of second order, can be upgraded to second order cones. And then um, there's an extra nonlinear hand, uh, constraint handler working on second order cones and linearizing that one. Um, there's something special if you have a QP, then we're adding some KKT reformulation. There's something um, that tries to get tighter underestimators or overestimators of x times y by instead of relaxing it over the box, um, using a polyhedral 2D projection of the LP relaxation. So a polyhedral two-dimensional 
fat um, and compute the tighter underestimator on this one. Um, and there are some more that are anyway off by default. And then there's another bound tightening techniques that solves, um, that looks like minimizing or maximizing one variable over the LP relaxation. So before we had maxima, uh, computing the bounds with respect to one nonlinear constraint, and this one is taking the whole LP and then computing bounds on the variable over that one. Um, yeah. Okay, then, yeah, Leon already mentioned some interfaces to skip. So these are the one uh, that can be used to um, access the nonlinear of input to MINLP and to skip. Um, so LP, MPS for quadratic ones. Um, OSIL is some XML format. Then the simple modeling language that comes with the, um, with the skip optimization suite. <clears throat> and then there are a number of packages that have interfaces to skip. So you can use the opti toolbox or jump or PySkip opt or the Java interface of skip and others. Um, yeah, and then skip using other software when it's solving MINLP. So usually what we do is that we linking it against IP opt, solve some NLPs from time to time, for especially in the primal heuristics. Um, to find feasible solution and be using CPPAD for the automatic differentiation. So <laughs> this was uh, five minutes on, uh, no, actually 10 minutes on how does we do NLP. And now I want to pass this on to Xenia who will do one example um, with PySkip of solving skip. Um, Let's see, I need to stop sharing, I believe. All right, so hi everybody. I'm going to do a little demonstration of a simple nonlinear problem. So let me share my screen and yeah, so that's the problem. It's called the circle packing problem and uh, the, the idea is uh, that you have uh, some fixed number of circles and uh, are given uh, the, the ready and you want to arrange the circles on some plane uh, so that they can uh, be fit inside some rectangle and you want the area of the rectangle to be as small as possible. And uh, this is the nonlinear programming formulation of this, pro of this problem. Uh, for the variables, we have uh, the coordinates of the centers of the circles, uh, x and y for each circle. And you also have the, the width, height, and area of the rectangle, which should uh, be around the circles. And uh, there are uh, two, or uh, the, there are the, the parameters are the number of circles, n, and the the circle radio R with the indices I. And uh, now we want to formulate it as an NLP. So we want to minimize the area of the rectangle. And uh, that because the objective uh, has to be linear, here we have uh, just uh, a, a separate uh, variable for area, which, which is constrained uh, by this. Uh, and we, we can have a, a greater than or equal constraint here because we aren't really interested in the lower bound on the on, on the in the upper bound on the area because we are minimizing anyway. And then we have the three constraints which uh, define the position of the circles uh, on the plane. So one uh, is that uh, we need the circles to be inside the rectangle. And that is defined by looking at each coordinate and making sure that uh, it doesn't go outside the rectangle on any side. Uh, so the rectangles are assumed to start as, at, uh, at zero and uh, then uh, they, they go to, to the right and up. And uh, the other constraint, which is uh, the second nonlinear constraint in this uh, program is uh, the constraint which requires that the circles do not overlap. 
which is uh, ensured by looking at the Euclidean distance between uh, the centers of two circles. So here this is squared, but if you take the square of this, then uh, on the left you'd have this distance and on the right you'd have the sum of the uh, radius of one circle plus the other one. But because uh, quadratic constraints uh, are generally nicer and there are more things that we can do for them, so we formulate this as a quadratic constraint, which is equivalent. And now I'm going to show how to implement this uh, little model in uh, PyScapeOpt. Uh, so here is the, the main uh, function where we, uh, we, in, we input some, uh, some parameters and uh, then uh, we create a model by calling this uh, packing function. Now let's have a look at the packing function, which is where most of the modeling takes place. So it takes two parameters and then first we need to create a skip model. And then we need to create some variables. It is all fairly straightforward. So you just uh, define these and then you, you add, uh, add them by calling uh, the add var function. And you specify the type. So here C stands for continuous. You give some name. And in this case, we also give a lower bound, which is uh, in this case, the corresponding radius. And in a similar manner, you add the remaining variables. And uh, uh, you can also add uh, not, not only continuous, but any variables, uh, also integer, binary, uh, in a very similar fashion, you just would have a different letter here. And uh, for the objective, uh, uh, this is also defined in uh, this uh, same line. Uh, in this uh, last parameter. So this uh, tells a uh, skip that uh, in the model, uh, the, the coefficient of uh, area in the objective is uh, one. So, and by default, uh, it is minimizing. So that means that we are minimizing the area. And then uh, constraints are also added in a rather straightforward manner. So here we just call add cons uh, and uh, uh, write them in a rather natural way. And uh, then the uh, PyScape opt uh, will recognize uh, what type of constraint is automatically. You don't have to worry about uh, anything like whether you have a linear or nonlinear constraint. It's really, uh, as a user, it would really be all the same. And uh, yeah, so these are all pretty similar here, adding some more constraints uh, uh, here with some powers. And then finally, you can save uh, some of the variables that you might want to be able to access to the data of the model. And then uh, another element that we have here is an event handler. So event handlers allow you to, to stop uh, skip at some uh, interesting uh, points uh, of the solution process. Like for example, and what we do in this case is that we stop where we find uh, a new best uh, feasible solution and uh, do something which uh, you can define. And this is defined here. So here we create this uh, class of uh, uh, an event handler for displaying uh, solutions. And uh, th these functions uh, allow to actually recognize the events. And uh, then you have the actual uh, code which would be executed whenever this event happens. And in this case, uh, we just make sure that uh, it is indeed the type of event that we want. And then we uh, call this model get best soul to uh, to update uh, the the information that's stored in the in the Python object by uh, getting the the latest information from uh, the Cscape itself, and uh, finally we call a function uh, called plot soul to plot the solution, uh, which is defined 
here. Uh, so it takes the variables, then you can access uh, uh, the value of each variable by model.val, and then it calls uh, some matplotlib functions to visualize the solutions. And now I'm going to demonstrate how this works. So now I'm running this file and it is going to show a bunch of uh, feasible solutions and they're going to be improving over time. So this is uh, the first solution found by some heuristic. Then we go on and we get another one and uh, you should see how uh, the circles here are going to take smaller and smaller area with each subsequent solution. So here we have this and then another one then it's going to run for a bit, but not for too long. Yeah, so here you can see the progress, uh, how much uh, of the gap has been closed, how much uh, the tree still remains. And yeah, then again, we get another solution and uh, finally it should terminate the descent. Yeah, and that should be the final solution. And then, uh, yeah, you get some, some information on uh, what your optimal objective is, uh, how many nodes uh, this took, and so on.